Hare Krishna and a warm welcome to Bhaktivedanta Mana for today's most auspicious uh, occasion of Gita Jayanti. We are coming to you from the Mana Haveli. Uh, on a normal year, in a normal year, we would have a thousand of you in this room and together with an amazing energy, we'd all be reciting the verses of the Bhagavad Gita. As we all know, this is not a normal year. 2020 has been an unprecedented time in world history. And we don't have a thousand of you here at the Haveli, but by the grace of modern technology, Facebook and YouTube, we have over a thousand of you online, I'm told, who are with us with your hearts and minds to go through the Bhagavad Gita today with great love and devotion. So a warm welcome to everyone. And before we embark on today's beautiful journey of the Bhagavad Gita, we'll offer our respects to our spiritual teachers, to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, and to all the great saints in our tradition who so gracefully delivered the words of Krishna and brought them into the reality of our lives so that we can benefit from those words and try to live them. Om Ajnanati Mirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshodun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishe Shashunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Once there was a man who made a resolution, a determination within his heart that he would climb to the peaks of the Himalayan mountains. So as he set off on his journey, he arrived at the foothills of the Himalayas and he checked into his hotel room in preparation for his next day's expedition. As he woke up the next morning, he put his mountaineering equipment on, his mountaining gear. He came to the ground floor of the hotel and as he walked and outside of the door, he opened the door and walked outside, he saw that there was a huge snowstorm. The temperature had dropped considerably. There were blocks all the way as he looked towards the peaks of the mountain and practically he saw nobody in sight. He looked back at the hotel uh, receptionist and then looked back at the door and continued walking towards the door. The receptionist looked at him and said, where are you going? How do you think you'll be able to reach the peaks of the Himalayan mountains in such conditions, with such obstacles, with such difficulties along the way? This man looked back at the receptionist and said, my heart has already reached the peak. And therefore, for my body to reach the peak will be very easy. And with those prophetic words, he stepped out and indeed uh, navigated all the difficulties and reached the peak of the Himalayan mountains. It's a beautiful story, a story that I think about again and again and again. It's a story which tells us that if we have an inner determination, if we have an inner desire, if we are uh, convinced about what we want to achieve, then there is no external obstacle, impediment or issue that can block us from achieving what we want to achieve. 
The Bhagavad Gita is an incredible book because it tells us the most amazing journey we can go on, the most exciting journey. Perhaps the Bhagavad Gita outlines to us the most important journey we are meant to go on in our life. And that is the journey to the peaks of spiritual happiness. And when we reach the peak of spiritual happiness that the Bhagavad Gita takes us on, at the peak we come face to face with God, we come face to face with Krishna. What could be a more exciting, a more adventurous, a more amazing journey to go on than the journey towards the peaks of spiritual perfection with Krishna? In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells us that if we implant this desire to reach the peak of spiritual perfection, if we implant that desire deep within our heart, then nothing can stop us. There can be no obstacle, impediment, no reason or excuse that could ever arise that could stop us from reaching. 2020 has been a challenging year. There have been many obstacles, impediments. This year in Gita Jayanti, we want to focus on how there is no impediment, there is no excuse for not going on this beautiful journey that the Bhagavad Gita invites us to go on. In the next five hours, we will embark on this journey. I will be trying to share with you the top 18 excuses that individuals may come up with in their life to prove to others that they shouldn't practice spirituality. And what I'll try to share with you is how Krishna ingeniously in the Bhagavad Gita refutes every single one of those excuses. In 18 chapters, Krishna leaves us with no more excuses. And that will be the theme of this year's Gita Jayanti. As a preparation, many of you are logged on to Facebook and you're logged on to YouTube. And I'll ask you, in the next few minutes, please, in the chat section, write some comments and tell us what do you think are the top excuses that we could conceivably come up with in our lives to justify not practicing spirituality with our heart. And as you write those down, I will be looking at them and I'm sure in the next 18 chapters we'll be learning how Krishna refutes every single one of them. Someone once said to me, if you're good at making excuses, then you'll never be good at anything else in your life. And therefore, by the end of today, we want to conclude the Gita realizing there's no excuse. And 2021 is the year in which our spiritual journey must go forward. Thank you all for your comments in YouTube and Facebook. We are monitoring everything. Sunil Gupta says, a lack of time. And Baska Patel says, too many other things to do. Yes, thank you to both of you. This is perhaps one of the most common excuses that people have. They say, I can't practice spirituality because my life is hectic. My life is demanding. There's so many things I have to attend to. Once a person came to me and he said, are you married? I said, no. He said, do you have a job? I said, no. He said, do you have a household and bills to pay? I said, no. He said, do you have children? I said, no. He said, therefore, because you've said no to every one of these qu questions, you have yes when it comes to time. That was quite a good argument. I wasn't sure how to respond, but then I looked back at him and said, was Arjun married? Yes. Did Arjun have a family? Yes. Did Arjun have a household to run? Yes. 
Did Arjun have a career and a job and a duty to perform in the world? Yes. Did Arjun have time for spirituality? Yes. In the first chapter of the Gita, we systematically see how this excuse of not having time just doesn't stand up. There are 640 million soldiers on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. They are arranged like pieces on a chessboard. There are millions of soldiers, there are uh, millions of fighters, animals, there are thousands of chariots. Uh, the atmosphere is like fever pitch, adrenaline is running. The conches are blowing and the sound of all the conches is deafening. And in the midst of all of that is Arjun who is probably the most important person on the whole battlefield. So many expectations, so much pressure on him. Everything, all eyes are on Arjun because he is the supreme archer. And in the middle of all of that intensity, what does Arjun say to Krishna? Senayor ubayor madhye ratam stapayame chuta yavadetam nirikshaham yodhukam anavastitan. Arjun, in the middle of this intensity, says to Krishna, Senayor ubayor madhye ratam stapayame chuta. Krishna, take my chariot to the middle of the battlefield so that I can spend some time reflecting on what is just about to happen. Can any of us say we have a more intense, more chaotic, more demanding situation than Arjun? We can't. And therefore, the excuse of not having time is not an excuse that's acceptable. In our life today, I want to share with you a super important mantra. In life, it's not about having time. It's about making time. If you were to embark on a journey to Scotland in your car, and someone asked you, did you go to the petrol station to fill up fuel? and you looked at them and said, I didn't have time. Imagine you were about to walk into an exam and as you were walking in, someone asked you, did you revise? And you say, I didn't have time. Imagine you took a pizza out of the freezer and you were just about to eat it and someone said, did you put that in the oven to heat it up? And you look at them and say, I didn't have time. In each of these situations, the person would look at you and think you're crazy. These things are so important that it's not a question of having time. It's a question of making time is absolutely necessary. Before we decide our goals in life, our direction, what we want to invest time, energy, and resource into, what our cherished aspirations are, first we need to understand what is life about. For that, we need to make time to read spiritual books. We need to make time to associate with spiritual people. And we need to make time to ask spiritual questions and more importantly, hear the answers that come back. In 2021, we want you all, myself included, to ensure that we have time for spirituality. Life is fast, life is hectic, and life is not going to get any slower. At the moment, we're in lockdown. And maybe when the world opens up, we'll be going at double speed, double pace. But today, on the day of Gita Jayanti, 
on the eve of 2021, a new year, let us make a resolution that we will make time for spirituality just as Arjun made time for spirituality. <clears throat> Otherwise, our life, what direction is it leading in? I leave you with a quote by Dalai Lama, who was once asked, what amazes you most about people? And you know his answer? He said, people sacrifice their wealth, sacrifice their health to get wealth. Then later on, they spend that wealth to get their health back. People are so much thinking about the future that they neither live in the present nor the future. People live as though they'll never die. And they die as though they've never lived. Let us make sure we don't die as though we've never really lived. Let us make sure we don't die without really <clears throat> fulfilling our deepest aspiration and deepest calling of the heart. And in order to ensure that that doesn't happen, we have to make time. Arjun made time. There's no excuse for us not to make time. We have just recited the second chapter of the Gita, and I really appreciate Ketan Agarwal's comment. He gives one of the main excuses people give. Ketan says, people say, I know this already. The Good Society, who are commenting on YouTube, say, I already know it, therefore I can't learn anything more. Yes, thank you for these comments. This is one of the main excuses we hear again and again and again. People tell us, I grew up with the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita has been in my home for generations. I uh, grew up coming to the temple. I know about Krishna. Uh, one person even told me, no, no, I've read the entire Gita. I've even read the 19th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, I had to later on tell him that there are only 18 chapters in the book. In this way, people give this excuse saying that they already know it. This is nothing new for me. For a moment, I want you to consider Arjun. Arjun grew up in a family of immaculate piety. Arjun grew up in a family in which he had complete observance of all religiosity. Arjun throughout his whole life followed dharma. But what does Arjun come to Krishna and say in the second chapter of the Gita? Karpanya dosho pahata svabhava prachamitvam dharma shamud chetaha yachre ashanishchitam bruhitan me shishyaste ham sadhimam tvam prapannam. Arjun, who is so qualified, who is such an incredible person, comes to Krishna and says, Krishna, I'm confused. I thought I knew. But I don't know. Krishna, shishya steham, sadhimam, dvam, prapannam. Krishna, now I become your humble disciple. I come to humbly learn from you. Please, Krishna, you instruct me. Arjun comes in front of Krishna in a mood of humility. Without humility, there is no knowledge whatsoever. In colloquial English, when someone is proud, we say they're full of it. And when someone is full of it, it means there's no room for anything new to go in. How can we say we know it all when Arjun said, I don't know it all? If you imagine all the knowledge of the world to be a circle, 
then one section of that circle is what you know you know. Another small section of that circle is what you know you don't know. But friends, shall I tell you something amazing? The biggest part of the circle of knowledge is the section you don't know what you don't know. There are so many things in this world that we don't know about. And when we open a book like the Bhagavad Gita, we begin to gain gems of wisdom, universal insights. We begin to gain knowledge which tells us about a bright future, which opens up many opportunities, which makes us think about life in a different way. But we'll never be able to access that knowledge of what we don't know if we don't have the humility to say, I don't know. And therefore, so many people may say they know the Bhagavad Gita. But what I tell them is that you may know about the Bhagavad Gita. That doesn't mean you know the Gita. You may know about Krishna. But that doesn't mean you know Krishna. What I often tell to these people is that when you learn a little bit, you think you know a lot. And when you actually learn a lot, then you realize, I don't know anything at all. Because humility naturally comes in the heart of someone who realizes there's so much more to learn. And therefore, if you ever come across a person who says, I already know, then try to share this with them, that Arjun didn't know, even though Arjun was so qualified. And if this thought ever comes up in our own minds and hearts, let us never make that mistake of thinking that we already know. Remember, learning is a lifelong mission. And therefore, we want to continue learning. And for that, we have to realize we don't know everything. We're looking at more excuses that we can come up with. Harish Patel says, a common excuse. I have to look after my wife and children. I'm doing my karma first. Dinesh Diwan says, I have involvement in worldly activities. Narinda says, practicing the Bhagavad Gita is more difficult than marriage. <laughs> I don't know, I can't confirm that but I'll take your word for it. Yes, this is perhaps the next main excuse that many, many people come up with. They say, I have so many duties, so many responsibilities, so many roles that I have to play in my life. Let me do all of these things first. Let me tie up all of the different worldly things I have to do. I got to earn a little bit more so that I can have some in the bank account for my children. I've got the last few things that I have to tie up in my business. Um, you know, I've got a few more payments left on my mortgage. And once I tie all of these things up, once I've fulfilled all of these responsibilities, then I will practice spiritual life. It's interesting that in chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna completely refutes this idea by encouraging each one of us to live a life of integration. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains to Arjun, Dasmad sarveshu kaleshu mamanusmarayudhyacha mayarpita mano buddhir very interestingly, Krishna says your worldly duties and your spiritual duties 
don't go in a sequence, but rather they go side by side. Krishna says to Arjun, Dasmad Sarveshu Kaleshu, at all times, Arjun. Ma Manusmara, remember me, remember your spiritual goal. Yudhyaja, and at the same time, do your duty in this world of fighting. Arjun has many, many things to balance in his life, and sometimes, well, actually, all of the time, we have many things that we have to balance in our lives. We're playing multiple roles. Some of you are playing the role of a father, a mother. Some of you are children. Some of you have duties in your career. You have so many different responsibilities and so many roles. And sometimes it can feel like they're all in conflict. Arjun wasn't any different. He also had many dharmas. Arjun had a kula dharma, a duty to his family. Arjun had a Kshatriya Dharma. He had a duty as a warrior. Arjun had a Pati Dharma. He had a duty as a husband. But Krishna looked at Arjun and he reminded him, yes, you have a Kula Dharma. Yes, you have a Kshatriya Dharma. Yes, you have a Raja Dharma. But never forget that you also have a Sanatan Dharma and those have to go side by side. When we do these two things side by side, you actually live the most successful life. Krishna is not saying don't be a good husband. Krishna is saying be a spiritual husband. Krishna is not saying don't be a good king. Krishna is saying, be a spiritual king. Krishna is not saying, don't be a father. Krishna is saying, be a spiritual father. And therefore, this idea that I have to fulfill all of my responsibilities and then later on I can do my Sanatan Dharma is not something which is endorsed by Krishna or recommended in any way, shape, or form. Once the great sage Narad Muni, who is a great devotee, a great renuncier, was traveling across the universe and he came into the presence of Vishnu and he asked Vishnu, who is the greatest devotee? Vishnu pointed out a poor farmer and he said, he is the greatest devotee. Narad Muni was shocked. He said, there are so many sannyasis. There are so many renunciates. There are so many who have given everything up to serve you. How will you say that this poor farmer is the greatest devotee? Vishnu looked at Narad and he said, I'll explain to you. But first, I want to give you a task. Here is a bowl and it's full of oil and it was full to the brim. Vishnu looked at Narada and he said, I know you're traveling across the universe. I want you to continue traveling across the universe, but I want you to carry this bowl full of oil with you and make sure you don't drop one little bit of oil on the ground. Narada, when he took up the task, he held the bowl very carefully, balancing it with all his attention with all his concentration, and he began traversing the universe. He went around the three worlds and came back into Vishnu's presence, and Vishnu said, very good, I can see you haven't spilt one drop of oil. And then he looked at Narad Muni and he said, while you were traveling across the universe, were you chanting Narayan's names? Narad Muni thought for a moment and he said, no, no, it was difficult to chant Narayan's names because I was doing your work. You gave me a, a, a work that required so much attention, that required so much concentration, that required so much balance. How could I, at the same time, chant Narayan's names? Vishnu then looked at the farmer and he said, you see that farmer? 
he also has many things to balance. He has a family life to balance. He has his job to balance. He has so many other responsibilities to balance. But while doing all of these duties, look at his mouth. And Narad looked and he was chanting Krishna's names. And Vishnu said, therefore I told you, he is the greatest devotee because he's learnt how to do all of his dharmas side by side. And this, dear friends, is the challenge for 2021. Try to begin to live an integrated life where we fill, fulfill all of our material responsibilities and our spiritual responsibilities side by side because really they should complement and nourish each other and it only requires some ingenious thinking. So in chapter 3, Krishna reassures us, don't give the excuse that you have too many duties to fulfill because all duties can, should, and are recommended to be fulfilled side by side. Thank you to all our viewers for sharing this broadcast. If you haven't already done it on Facebook, YouTube, and your WhatsApp groups, then please continue sharing this. And this is your way of sharing the Gita with as many people as possible. And thank you for your comments. We are looking at your comments. And if you would like to ask any questions, then do put them on the comments. And we'll try to raise those points. We're continuing with the excuses that we may come up with as we ascend on this spiritual journey. Usha Chotai says, the Bhagavad Gita is too complicated. And Jagruti Tana says, the Bhagavad Gita is difficult to read. Yes, this is one of the excuses that people often come up with. They say, I'm not intelligent enough to read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I don't know Sanskrit. I'm not a philosopher. Um, I, I'm not someone who generally even reads books. Um, I'm a very, very simple person. Sometimes when I hear all of this knowledge, it goes in one ear and it comes out of the other ear. Um, some people say, I'm, I'm old, I'm an old. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. So some people feel that the Bhagavad Gita, the spiritual journey is not possible for them because they're not intelligent enough to understand the knowledge given by Krishna. In the fourth chapter, Krishna answers this reservation that we may well have. Krishna says to Arjun, Sa evaya maya tedya yoga prokta puratana Bhakto sime sakha cheti rahasyam hyatadutamam. Krishna looks at Arjun and he says, Rahasyam, this knowledge is very, very confidential. But Arjun, this confidential knowledge you can understand. Why? Bhakto sime sakha cheti. Because Arjun, you are a bhakta. You are devoted, Sakha Chaiti, and you are very, very friendly towards me. Dear friends, this is the only qualification to understand the Gita. One does not need to be a scholar. One does not need to be a philosopher. One does not have to be an academic. One does not have to have five degrees and letters after their name. One simply has to have a sincere and willing heart. One must be a bhakta, a devotee, and one must be a sakha, a friend towards Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita is knowledge which is understood on the level of the heart, not on the level of the intellect. And therefore, when we have a desire to understand what Krishna is telling us, and when we desire to actually then take that knowledge and apply it in our life, 
Then Krishna says, Dadami buddhi yogam tam, I will give you all the intelligence required. In the fourth chapter of the Gita, Krishna outlines how we should receive this knowledge. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshyanti te jnanam jnaninas tatvadarshina. Krishna says, this is how you can overcome your reservation that is too difficult to understand. First thing is, Tadvidi pranipatena. Submit and go towards a spiritual teacher and inquire from them in a humble spirit as to what is the meaning of the Bhagavad Gita. But you don't just have to be a passive hearer, Krishna says. Hear and then pariprashnena. Present questions before that person and try to clarify your understanding. And then Krishna says, Sevaya, do service. If you're humble and you listen, if you ask questions and deeply think about what you're hearing, and if at the same time you render service to Krishna and show that, yes, Krishna, I am devoted to you, I am a friend to you, then all the tattva, all the truth of spiritual knowledge will be revealed within your heart. The knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita, the knowledge of spiritual life is not just about acquiring more and more information. Sometimes people think knowledge in the spiritual sphere is linear, so you learn more and more and more. More verses, more stories, more information. However, learning in a spiritual sphere is not about a linear learning where you're learning more and more, but it's about a spiral learning. In spiritual life, we learn in a spiral. We hear the same verses. We hear the same stories. We hear the same insights of the great teachers over the ages. And as we hear these things again and again and again, we begin to actually get to the essence of knowledge and the essence of the Bhagavad Gita is actually very, very simple. You are a spiritual being. God is the Supreme Spirit. And if you give your heart to Him in a selfless, unmotivated way, then not only will you rediscover your love for Krishna, you will rediscover your love for everyone around you and you will rediscover your love for life is so simple, you may just miss it. And therefore, don't be in any doubt or an anxiety that you're not intelligent enough to understand the Gita because Krishna says, it's rahasyam, it's very confidential, but because you're a devotee and because you're my friend, you will very easily be able to understand this knowledge. Therefore, I'm not intelligent enough is not an excuse for not going on the spiritual journey. We don't all need to be told that this has been one of the most challenging years in perhaps the history of the world. A pandemic, a global crisis. Sometimes people come to me and say, this is all very nice, sitting down, reading a book, worshipping, praying, chanting. To be honest, I'd prefer to spend my time doing something practical to help the world. And this is one excuse that comes up again and again and again. What will this do? What will all of this spirituality do to solve the economic problems, to solve the environmental problems, to solve the social problems that we see in the world today? Rather than being selfish and just working on my own spirituality, I would rather prefer 
to do something to benefit and make the world a better place. Interestingly, in the fifth chapter, Krishna gives us a complete paradigm shift. In a beautiful verse in the fifth chapter, Krishna says, Vidya vinaya shampane brahmane gavihastini Pandita Samadarshina. Krishna explains if one gets vidya, which means knowledge, then naturally they will become vinaya, which means gentle and kind. Vidya vinaya sampanne endowed with knowledge and kindness, one becomes a pandita, a greatly learned person. And what does a pandita have? Samadarshina, spiritual vision to see the equality of all living beings. The vision to see the spirit in everything. For a moment, what I want you all to consider is that all the problems we see in the world are due to a lack of spiritual vision. Do we have material vision or do we have spiritual vision? If we have material vision, we will exploit. If we have spiritual vision, we will nurture. If we have material vision, we will be all about taking. If we have spiritual vision, we'll be all about giving. If we have material vision, our whole life will be about enjoying. But if we have spiritual vision, our life will be about serving. If we have material vision, then every act we perform will be driven by selfishness. But when we have spiritual vision, we're impelled by selflessness. The biggest change we can make in the world is the change to give spiritual vision to as many individuals as possible. Because when there is spiritual vision in the world, then all of the problems we see in the world will disappear. If there was spiritual vision in the world, would you have racism, which is based on the temporary body? If there was spiritual vision in the world, would you have sexism, which is based on the temporary body? If there was spiritual wisdom in the world, would you have ageism, which is based on the temporary body? If you had spiritual vision in the world, would you have uh, nationalism, which is based on the temporary body? I'll give you one more thought. If we had spiritual vision in this world, would we have speciesism, which is when we discriminate that this is an animal, this is a human, and therefore we can mistreat animals and, and, and treat humans fine. If we have that kind of discrimination, we end up in a world situation which we face at the moment. Coronavirus is zoonotic. It stems from animals and particularly the mistreatment and disharmony we have with the animal kingdom. We may all want to run around and do something to try and solve the coronavirus pandemic, but if everyone was a little wise to have spiritual vision before, then we may not find ourselves in this mess in the first place. Therefore, our dear friends who say, I want to do something practical to help the world, Krishna says, do the most practical thing, which is in your own life, develop spiritual vision, and then try to give that spiritual vision to as many people as possible, because it's that spiritual vision which is ultimately going to create the most powerful, the most sustainable, and the most comprehensive solutions in the world today. It is great to have a passion to do something to help the world, but passion must have a compass of knowledge. Because when the passion to help the world 
meets with the compass of spiritual knowledge, then that passion plus the compass becomes compassion. And it is that compassion that we want each and every person to show in the world to really make the world a better place. So be in no doubt by reading the Gita, by living the Gita, and by giving the Gita to as many people as possible, you are doing the greatest welfare work in the entire universe. Monica Srivastava has shared with us one of the excuses that people often come up with. She says, my mind is unsettled and not able to focus because of worries of my children. Yes, thank you for sharing, Monica. This is one of the main excuses people have. I'm too active. My mind is restless. My mind is always moving. If you ask me to do meditation, to be still, to do prayer, uh, these things are not for me. I'm a very active person. I'm a very energetic person. I'm a person who can't just sit down and do nothing. Um, therefore, I don't think so spirituality is for me, at least not for me at this stage in my life. Lucky for you, uh, Monica, and lucky for all of those of us that have this excuse that Krishna directly answers in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna talks all about the active mind that each one of us are battling with. Krishna says to Arjun, Janchalam Himana Krishna, Pramati Balavadridam. Dasyaham nigraham manye vayur eva sudushkaram. Arjun looks at Krishna and says, Chanchalam hi mana Krishna. Krishna, my mind is always flickering. Pramati balavadridam. It's obstinate, stubborn, and very, very strong. Dasyaham nigraham manye. Krishna, to subdue my mind to make it become still. Vayuriva sudushkaram. Krishna, I think you're asking me to do something which is more difficult than controlling the wind. An active, restless, constantly energetic mind and body is something that every single person is battling with. One cannot say, I'm too active and therefore I cannot meditate. One cannot say when my energy, activeness and restlessness comes down, then I'll meditate. It's as crazy as saying, when I become cured of my disease, then I'll go to the hospital. When I fulfill the demands of my stomach, then I'll go to the restaurant. Once I've got all of the knowledge I require, then I'll read the book. No, this doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. The reason you go to the hospital is to get better. The reason you go to the restaurant is so that you can fill yourself up. And so the reason why you read books is so that you can become knowledgeable. And therefore, the reason why you meditate is so that you can find some peace, some stillness, and some genuine contemplation and reflection in your life, for this is absolutely necessary. So sometimes if someone comes to me and says, I'm too active, restless, and my life's so chaotic that I can't meditate even for 10 minutes, then I look at them and I say, then for you, you have to meditate for 20 minutes. Because this is absolutely necessary. Krishna is not saying our life shouldn't be active. Krishna is not saying our uh, navigation through this world shouldn't be full of energy. That's all fine. But Krishna says you must also take some time to control your own mind. Therefore, when an archer shoots an arrow, 
The whole idea is to hit the target as quick and as powerfully as possible. It's all about activity. But what does the archer first do? First, the archer pulls back the arrow. Because when you pull back the arrow, then you can generate more power. You can adjust your aim and you can release the arrow at the right time. So by all means, be active in the world. But by taking time to retreat and meditate, you actually end up being more powerful, more effective, and you make more impact in the world. And therefore, when Arjun says to Krishna that, I think it's impossible, I can't control the mind, more difficult than to control the wind, Krishna replies and gives the solution, Asamsaya Mahabaho Mano Durni Graham Chalam Abhyasena Tukonteya Vairagyena Chagriyate Asamsaya Mahabaho Undoubtedly, Arjun, what you are saying is true. Mano Durni Graham Chalam To control the mind is difficult. Abhyasena but if you do two things, you can control your mind. First thing is vairagya, detachment. Don't take your mind so seriously. Sometimes learn to ignore your mind and by, this, by doing this, you quieten the mind. And second thing, abhyas, do spiritual practice. Because by that, you can remold the mind. So yes, Krishna says, the mind is crazy, the mind is active, the mind is restless, but you must control it. And you do it by quieting the mind and then by remolding the mind. And in this way, you will be able to focus. You will be able to uh, generate real, deep, spiritual energy in your life. However, it is a discipline and it requires discipline.